Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to the four o'clock panel. Another truth be told, women of color um, have many histories. I'm Adrienne Lent Smith. I'm a former Mendenhall Fellow at Smith College, um, and I am moderating the panel. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to fabulous scholars, um, which I'll do very quickly, and then we will jump into conversation. We have this afternoon, Paula Giddings, um, who is the Elizabeth Woodson 1922 Professor Emerita at Smith College, um, former Meridian's editor, former book editor and journalist, and author of um, some decent books, um, including <laughs> Women Where I Enter and Ida, A Sword Among Lions, um, from which this article, or to which this article that we're under discussing is related. Um, and then we have Vivian May, who is director of the Humanities Center and professor of women's and gender studies at Syracuse University um, and director of a consortium of many humanity centers in central New York, um, in the majestic central New York. Um, <laughs> she is the author of Anna Julia Cooper, Cooper a visionary black feminist and of pursuing intersectionality. Okay, and we're gonna be talking about their articles, one on Ida B. Wells, one on Harriet Tubman. And what I think I'll do just to open up the floor, I hope y'all will talk to each other more than me, um, but I'll ask you to begin by <coughs> reflecting a bit on what you were working on and through <coughs> um, when you first published your pieces in Meridians. I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, uh, since you're not going to give us a lot of directions, it looks like Adrian. So I might uh, come in. I'll steer you. I'll steer you as you go. So, so I was working on a biography of Ida B. Wells that eventually became Ida Sword Among Alliance. And what was so extraordinary, I was I was near the end of my research, and I came across a day book uh, in her papers. Uh, and there was a little note, this is towards the end, this is a year before she died. There was a note that said that she had gone to a, an Association of Negro Life and History meeting in Chicago. Uh, they had, they, the group read a book on black history by Carter G. Woodson, the father of Negro history, and that she was disappointed that her name was not mentioned. This is 1930. And I said, how could this be? <laughs> no, I mean, not not only. Uh, I mean, I think many of us know her, her uh, the basic outlines of her biography by, by now. You know, anti 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 lynching suffrage suffragists, uh, uh, Negro Fellowship League, Settlement House, co uh, founder of NAACP. I mean, just extraordinary. Covered in the press. Um, and, uh, at one point, when Frederick Douglass died in '95, it was thought that she was she was the leading race person. You know, Du Bois is still in Europe, and and Booker hasn't made Booker T. Washington hasn't made his famous speech yet, and so all of this, and oh, and uh, Carter G. Woodson had actually come to the Negro Fellowship League to talk. She had and invited him when he was trying to put all of this together. This association, and his partner was a man named Cleveland Hall, who was a physician and who had delivered at least one of Ida's children. So how is this, so how is this missing? So, and that thought of it, and I'll maybe talk, but the thought of it made me rethink so much of the research I had done and my own assumptions and perspective uh, to just answer to answer that question. Uh, and so that was what I uh, wrote about uh, in my piece. I think it's called Missing in Action and trying to explain why Ida Wells is not in the text. She, weren't, she wasn't in the text of her contemporaries either. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, I was, and, and so that, that article, that essay is really about trying to explain that. And Paula, if we have time, I want to talk about 
Cooper and Woodson and Washington yes. and a whole bunch of other stuff I thought about in rereading your article, but that's not what I'm supposed oh, yes. to be talking about right now. So I'm going to be yes. better behave for a second and answer <laughs> the question I've been okay. asked. Um, which is, what was I that's working rare with? Myself. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I can be compliant. <laughs> um, I want to be respectful because Adrian's asked us a nice question. So, um, yes, very good questions. <laughs> so I want what was I working on at the time? And I have to say that, first of all, I am not, you know, I'm not an in-depth historian or scholar of Tubman. Um, I got into this particular piece on Tubman thanks to an invite from Janelle Hobson at Albany who held a symposium on Tubman. And I had been working um, for many years, like 10 or 15 on uh, Anna Julia Cooper. Um, but I had been shifting at this particular time into the next book on intersectionality and jumping forward a hundred years and thinking, man, the distortions that Cooper was navigating and anticipating in her work are, they, they, they just transmogrify and con are sort of consistent over time. And thinking about the ways, the kind of careless ways that someone ubiquitous and highly cited like Crenshaw is read, well, apparently read. Every time I read people who said they've read Crenshaw, I think, really, you read her? <laughs> um, <laughs> What? Um, so thinking about how like when Cooper opens a voice from the South and basically says she has the right to have her say at the bar of the nation and wants to be heard, but she also basically in the preface in two pages says, and yet I basically expect mostly not to be heard. If you hear me, you will distort me um, and I'm likely to be forgotten. So this this kind of conundrum of anticipating, you know, this this is a kind of riff, this is a kind of ripple effect over time. And I didn't know it at the time, Adrian, that what in doing this shift and thinking about connections between Crenshaw and Cooper and a side trip to Tubman, and they're actually all related in terms of this question of distortion as a form of violation. Because it's one of the afterlives of slavery it is in the kind of it, the interpretive violations are connected to the physical violations, the structural violations and so forth. Um, I was on a, on a journey that would get me more depressed which is where I am now, which is thinking, <laughs> <laughs> thinking maybe about the limits of recovery work, like thinking back to Cooper and it kind of haunts me how she anticipated, even if we have her in print, Cooper, or even if we have Tubman, maybe pocket memorials in the form of a $20 bill um, or physical memorials, or now we have two national parks and so forth. You can have a certain kind of public memory, but it can be itself be a distortion. And that shows the kind of limits of recovery work if the afterlives of slavery that are in the public imaginary or in the in our embedded in our imaginations continue to live on and sort of haunt us. So that is a way longer answer than you probably mm -hmm. wanted, but there you go. <laughs> no, I want all the answer. I want everything. I also so I have a million different follow-up questions I could ask. I think what I'll do is to ask the simplest and shortest to pa Paula, which is why, right? Like why this not forgetting, deliberate writing out of, ignoring, right? Because you read that article and what you think is, man, these are some petty people, just <laughs> petty, right? But petty is not a, an analytical term-ish, it could be. You can imagine write, writing like pettiness, a reader, but like what, what's going on there? Yeah, and academics then, could make it one. You know? <laughs> who, who better, right? Um, but then, yeah, so yes. why? And then let's come to this question of distortions. And, yes, yes. And what well, we well uh, 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 yes, uh, one thing that though is, is a, uh, one, you don't have to be so depressed because you can do what Ida did, which was write her own autobiography. I mean, this is when she, right? She's, I think she knows She knows exactly that she better write her autobiography if she's going to be in history. And I tell you, without it, which took 40 years to get published, without that autobiography, I don't know how much of us, how many of us would be talking about her right now. So there are solutions. Um, why she was, you know, of, of course, I, I went through the the early, the, you know, the the, the obvious stuff, uh, sexism and racism, and uh, uh, and but that it, it didn't explain everything of of, of her being uh, missing. Uh, and what I began to think about, and what I've evolved about thinking about, is um, 
you know, she uh, she was not. Uh, well, let's talk about any stuff. The NAACP sort of takes over lynching and marginalizes her. That's one thing, and, and that's of course a very powerful organization <laughs> in, in this uh, in, in this period. She talks badly about everyone in public, you know, black, white, male, female, all the progressives. She you know uh, has she criticizes in, at one point in her life. So. And that's that's uh, an issue, but there is a larger issue which uh, I'm thinking about more in work I'm doing now, which is you know she is not a representative Negro, and that's how uh, history got told by representative men and representative women. Uh, and so she she doesn't fit in those categories. She's leaving Victorianism well behind. And following the logic of lynching, she's talking about somebody when no one else is, and interracial sex when no one else is. She's using the word rape when no one else is. So she's certainly not a representative woman in that conservative sense. She's not a. She can't represent the race because she's uh, because she is a woman. And uh, it's you know it's very poignant to me when you when she goes to England. Uh, and the English are saying, but do you represent the race? And she writes back to Frederick Douglass, say, Fred, Fred, tell them I represent the race. And Fred says, well, she's courageous. Well, she's telling the truth. But he will never say she represents the race. Never. And she begs him because she knows exactly what the issue is. And, and he won't do it. Uh, so... Uh, so she falls, and I just think about all of us, and uh, as we talk about black uh, feminists falling in betwixt and between in so many ways, not you know, not uh, uh, and and she does. So this is a so this is a an issue, and really, you, you know, I think the culture is just sort of catching up to her now. Yeah. Um. And then you contrast it with someone like Tubman, who, as you like, what a smart and delightful article, Vivian. Because I have, I, I think I mentioned this in the email. I had just watched Harriet, which made me a little bit bananas. Um, <laughs> like, the culture uses her in a bunch of different ways. But right. as you like, at the title of your article, she is somehow like under theorized and under taught in some substantive way. Um, so it's like people want her to be representative, not of the race necessarily, but of this uh, kind of American redemption story. They want her very exceptional, exceptionality, exceptionalness to do certain work for a broader, like America will be okay story without it requiring work on their part. Right, I mean, you know, when Booker T, when Booker T comes to Auburn and, and says, you know, <laughs> this like, law abiding good woman and you think what i mean you know, <laughs> come on <laughs> like, it, it's such a but it's a, it's it's not only off it's it's just it's so violent to do this to her and to kind of um co-opt and borrow her for for every need that you might have as opposed to you know or this that the state might have you know so i i talk in there about how you know how many um how many public housing projects, prisons, and so forth are named after Tubman, and yet we're having a big old fight over a $20 bill. Um, so there's some, and even that as a representative of the nation, I mean, th there's problems there too in terms of currency and so forth. I mean, we could, <laughs> we could go down a lot of side trips here. But, um, you know, but there's also been a lot of change. I mean, I, your questions that you sent us I know we weren't supposed to go and have to do extra homework, but I couldn't help myself because that's, you know, we're all, <laughs> so, you know, because um, the other thing I was going to tell you that I didn't. No, that's true of you, Vivian. I, I, you <laughs> can't help, I can help myself. But, yes. well, you, you're working on a new project and I seem to be just working on wearing like three administrator hats. So yeah, let me just say, right. I was going to say the other thing I didn't know, Adrian, is at that time I was just about to take on multiple administrative positions and having a chance to, to think about um, being here today has reminded me that I might have something to say as a scholar again at some point, <laughs> and I shouldn't forget that. But I was just taking a look and, you know, I have to say that there's just a lot of cool stuff that has happened. Um, 
although there can just continues to be umpteen children's books, weird portraits and portrayals, fragmented stories about Tubman. Uh, it's very rare that you can get that long arc of her life and think about how she fought against poverty, against you know housing and inequality, about support for the aging. About I mean, it goes on and on, right? She sees all the interconnected structures of inequality and works on them as she goes. But there's cool work happening, like in um, Black Girl Geography by Lauren Cahill. Um, Erica Dunbar did uh, a great book called She Came to Slay, you know, that tries to tell um, Tubman's story in, in a way that's accessible, but not necessarily for only young people, but could be. Um, you know, and Damaris Hill has a poetry collection on thinking about incarceration of Black women from Tubman through Sandra Bland. Like, there's just, there has been different kinds of things happening since this point in time, too. I do want to acknowledge that. I don't just want to be depressed. <laughs> so, to, to answer Paula, you don't have to be depressed. There are some solutions. And some people have been working on them. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> um, and, and to further your lack of depression, I mean, part of it is that it's, it takes a while for the academic, for the scholarship to move the public understanding. And that movement is met with an intense amount of resistance, hence the rejection of intersectionality or critical race theory or like whatever um, the sort of popularized academic terms. Or the co-optation. Yeah, or, or the, the co-op, the yeah. deep co-op, the tense and perpetual co-optation. Um, but let's talk a little bit to go back to the kind of understandings of these figures and ongoing conversations and to shimmy back, you said that like Ida B. Wells is in the culture now, right? And she's precisely because she's not exactly representative, but because she was had her finger in so much, you see like people turning to her to open up understandings of suffrage or, you know, calls for self-defense or, you know, com being more complex about how we talk about sexual violence. And what in the kind of more contemporary, not more contemporary, in the in the books or the articles or the sort of engagements with Wells that have happened since since your book, like what do you find energizing or promising in in kind of her current uses? <coughs> I think one of the attractions uh, to Wells is uh, uh, two things, and and I think it comes out in a lot of this representation. Um, one is just, I mean, is is just the courage, which is just <laughs> incredible, and we're we're not in courageous times, you know, and and I think people look towards this kind of, and, and not just physical courage, because we know, you know, she carried a gun and said she's going to take somebody with her if she had to. And, uh, uh, but she, but a courage of conviction where you just go against the grain all the time, all the time, all the time, uh, and uh, standing for what, what is right. She's really incorruptible in that in, in that way and believe me i look for i look for all, all the flaws and all the and she has other kinds of issues but not that one uh, uh and, I, and i think people i i think people uh um uh, uh, she she's she's so you know uh um i think that's i think that's one thing that that people aren't afraid to say and will be embarrassed that something else will, will come up later about her so I think that's been I think that's been very important, and she's just a uh, uh, she's a heroic figure, and she's a larger than life figure, uh, and she's a figure that sort of exemplifies uh, what we're talking about now, which are, which are large movements. She was one of the first to really say, uh, you know, we don't need just movements from the top down; we need grassroots movements. We need to empower the working class, especially. Uh, we need civil disobedience, and we need to grow the movement from the bottom up. And she's one of the really first uh, to do that. And so she sort of falls in line now, or uh, uh, people are falling in line with what she is, what she had uh, put forth uh, some time ago. Okay. That there's a way that she fits much more easy easily into 
histories that emphasize social movements than institutional history. I mean, you can, I mean, one of the things that comes through also in your article is how much, how so not down with that the founders of the NAACP <laughs> would have been. Absolutely. 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 Well, you know, it's also people, these institutions have different functions and, and the NAACP had a legal function. I mean, so it wouldn't even, it took a long time, much to Ida's frustration, uh, for them to even support an anti-lynching bill because they were afraid it was anti-constitutional. You know, please, Ida says, please, and that kind of, you know, give me a break. So, so, uh, 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 and they were very representative. They were very respectability oriented. They, Ida Wells took on cases that they wouldn't because uh, the figure was flawed, you know, right. It wasn't right. So, and she's all, she also represents that, you know, in our, I think our, our present moment uh, uh, as well. So a George Floyd can be flawed. It doesn't mean we can't create a global movement around him. Right. Well, both of y'all talk a little bit about militancy, how, you know, whether you're, it's Tubman or um, or Wells or anyone, I mean, I don't actually think about Anna Julia Cooper with militancy, although maybe I should, but like, like how we think about black women as militant figures and how that fits in these kind of broader, I mean, I'm thinking not necessarily academic narratives, but public narratives and how we get people to understand the layers of of history and and the, of the struggles that we're trying to to tell. Like, how do they help? How do they help us narrate militancy in a way that uh, a non historian or someone who doesn't think about these things would understand? I, I was listening to your uh, other panel around uh, narratives. I talked about narratives. And that's actually what I've gotten very interested in now because, uh, you know, we have the history, but we don't have the story. Uh, and uh, I mean, as a commemoration around suffrage uh, this year and last year shows, the story has remained the same, despite all of the history we have. It's brilliant. Right. It's brilliant, right? But the story remains the same. And, and I was very uh, taken by a book that we all know by now called The Myth of Seneca Falls, which really talked about uh, how the Seneca Falls uh, became the origin story for the women's rights movement. And it's completely false. It's a myth. <laughs> right? yeah. but, she paints, but she paints the author, Detroit, painstakingly puts together of how that myth was created. So, so, and myth not meaning, meaning not necessarily falsity, but myth as a venerated story from which we learn about uh, about our world. Right. So, I think we need to do more of that. You know, of thinking about uh, of thinking about creating uh, of how to create the narrative. Uh, and uh, and I've been thinking about that how to create the story. There was another. Uh, there was another panel when someone was talking about who who who's benefiting from feminism, right? <laughs> yeah, and the way feminism uh, has been particularly predominantly white, been structured uh, and narrated. You know, uh, black women aren't benefiting to to make women of color aren't benefiting enough from feminism, right? Because of the way the story is told about it. So, so those are things I, I, I'd really have to uh, think about more. We have the tools, we have intersection, we have everything. We have the story, we have the, we have the history, but we've got to get the story down. But even when we have the story down, like I'm thinking of Sherry Randolph's book on Flo Kennedy, yeah. uh, um, and you know, in terms of just digging in both to have the history, but then also to frame the story about like, what are the stories we tell about feminism and how do we think about radical black women or insurgency or militancy there's different ways and facets of this what? of this um and yet still i just you know 
forget Tubman, how many people are teaching about Flo Kennedy in a women's studies class? <laughs> so, I mean, I don't mean forget Tubman, but I'm just sort of saying, even with more a more recent past, kind yeah. of thinking yeah. about some of these things. And yet, on the other hand, like, again, there's just these tensions. I mean, I don't think there's a yes, no answer to some of the questions you're answering, because I asking, I'm just think, thinking like, um, in the hashtag like roads must fall movement in South Africa in terms of decolonizing the university and like Tubman was invoked, you know, to, you know, like 150 years later in a, in a completely different context, seem, seemingly completely different context, where taking down public monuments and, uh, you know, of of colonization of uh, of white supremacy and so forth at at the pillars of the university. How does that matter? And and Tubman comes to play comes into the public forum there, and yet still often is in the shadows in other contexts here. So it's complicated. Um, but I don't know how we get the story. This is this is. I mean, back to being depressed for a second. <laughs> um, this is this is this is the vexing thing. This is the thing that you know, as as you said, Paula. I mean, how is it that we still? I mean, okay, I'm Seneca Falls, like 45 minutes from my house here right next to, not far from, Tubman's home, by the way, <laughs> Auburn is <laughs> right next to each other. Um, um, and, you next know, to a federal penitentiary. Next to a federal penitentiary, Douglas's house, where it was burned down in Rochester, not that far away either, um, right. on the way to Canada. Um, so the question is though, how is it that the same old tired, not true, distorted story, say, of, uh, you know, Feminism keeps getting told, so we have like the Seneca Falls tale, if you like. Um, and it's not again; it's not just that it's partial or, or whatever. It's it's a violation. So we have all the history, or we've done the recovery work. We've done, you know, dug into the archives, rethought things, um, <clears throat> and back to whether I just want to say we could think of Cooper maybe as insurgent in different ways. She was insurgently for um, black education, and let me say that. Let me say that she thought the NAACP was completely off, off in the 1930s, fighting, leading the pathway to Brown v. Board and fighting for school desegregation because she thought it was going to be the end of black education that focused on the welfare and the benefit of black children and black consciousness globally. And she was right, <laughs> not the end of, but it was it was going to be a structural. And and people like Du Bois and stuff just thought she was just a, a silly old lady who didn't know any different, um, you know. Uh, but how do, how do we intervene in the story? I think this is something Cooper uh, struggled with when she was- yeah, we, write it. we write it, we write it. I know, we do. <laughs> I mean, we should need to write it. <laughs> but there's a, there's a politics of reception um, yeah. and interpretation yeah. of it, being taken up of it, being having a life, being treated as a living, as, yeah. as, as a living, breathing uh, story that, that can maybe supersede or at least live alongside the other one. Yes. Um, There's also the politics of the narrative in academia, right? We don't, we don't do many narratives, do we? You know, hey! We need, to, we need to think about <laughs> we need to think about those kinds of things, I think, yeah. more, you know. There's, yeah. a great, there's a great, I just came across something, um, which, um, uh, and, and other people might, might know this, but I, the first time I'd seen it, uh, an interviewer asked Carrie Chapman Catt, Takes over the national, the NW, NAWSA, the white suffrage organization, and they ask her about Harriet Tubman as a suffragist, and they, and they said, did, you know, was Harriet Tubman as a suffragist? Did they help your movement? And she says, what? She says, suffragist? She wasn't a suffragist. She didn't do anything for us. We did something for her. Oh my God! See, there you go. So, yeah. You know, so yeah, you know, so it's um, so we have to talk more about Harriet as a as a suffragist. It's um, I mean, I also really like in the article, Vivian, the way that you center her as an as an insurgent and an outlaw, which there's some part of me, the cartoon part of my brain, is like, we need someone to write a country song, yeah. like you know, <laughs> outlaw. That's all about Harriet Tubman. Let that do do some work. We'll ask Lil Nas X to like write a Harriet Tubman country song for us. Um, but this actually, this question of how ideas circulate 
um, and how they get traction and what happens to them. It makes me think of this question that I had mentioned to y'all that I wanted to ask, which is that intersectionality itself as a term has like, has made it, I mean, you know, talk about these unlikely things. You mentioned the sort of like, have you read Kimberly Crenshaw? Do you really get the argument? But whether people have or not, I mean, intersectionality is a little bit like Ben Anderson and imagined communities. Like people mention it all the time. And that happens like in academic work, but it also happens in like the Twitter sphere, right? So how has the, the populariz popularization of the term through in some instances, social media or other kind of, kind of in more informal circulation of ideas. And then the, <laughs> the backlash against it, like, you know, I think I described it as a racist bugbear, right? The people who are like, don't you dare talk to us about intersectionality. Um, do you, like, why do you think it's, why do you think it's gained the circulation? And what do you think has happened through its circulation? Part of me wants to say, has it actually gained the, cir the circulation that it seems to have? Because the, when you see what's out there, whether it's informally, like Twitter sphere, or all the way up to European Union, uh, of course, interestingly, it's often not implemented. Sometimes it's implemented in gender equity, but not race equity. Like it gets, what right. the thing is, is it gets, it gets fragmented actually, and pulled apart, which yeah. is a violation of the very, of the very <laughs> core meanings of intersectionality, which is to um, kind of address the, the interlocking systems of domination at their core because they interrelate. Um, and it is about interlocking identities, but identities within structures and so forth. And it has this long tradition in this radical black feminist um, it's not just an intellectual tradition, but a tradition of grassroots activism, as Paula has laid out. And um, that long history falls away. It's contemporary origins and roots within how Crenshaw named it and what she's been doing with those early um, early essays and since um, in terms of both critical legal theory and uh, community action and uh, activism. All of that is sort of sheds. It becomes a cartoon of itself. Um, so you have this, you have a cartoon imagination. You want the country song. I'm like, I have a cartoon imagination. I want this all this this all to stop. It so it circulates powerfully on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, it seems to me to be another side of violation to what is happening to intersectionality as it travels um, and is co-opted, bartered with used bluntly, um, carelessly, that, that, that it's treating, concepts come from lived body experiences and histories. So in some ways it is a violation of those lived experiences and histories and how people carelessly treat the concept. That's what is so to me appropriate to use, you know, I know I got Cooper in my head, so I got 19th century vocabulary. Coming. I like it. I right. like 19th century. Right. But it's also, <laughs> and, and to go back to your earlier, like you talked about distortion, right, and the transmogrifi transmogrification, but like it is being altered and changed, but by like divesting it in some ways of its analytical heft. Is that what you're? And it's radical political yeah. vision. Yeah. It's, a, it's a vision of, of of substantive transformation of our entire way of being from top to bottom. I mean, it, that, it's not it's not this kind of decorative little term, <laughs> but it's sort of treated like it's like an accessory or something. Um, and then the incorporation within the university in the DEI work and so forth is just, you know, let, let's not. Right. It's not get totally depressed. <laughs> right. Well, we could have whole a whole conversation about these right? words and DEI and yeah. what they have like yes. what they do or don't do. By the way, y'all, there is a button at the bottom of the screen that says, ask a question. You should put some questions in there and so that we might ask them or I might ask them of the panelists. We'll switch to doing that in about six minutes. But So, so, the, so the positive side to which, <laughs> to whom, of course, I defer about these, 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 these questions. No, no. Yeah, well, no, with you, of your brilliant and deep knowledge of theory and intersection, but, uh, um, even when it's misused, 
what, what we've seen is uh, a mass movement using the word intersection, even if people, if, even if they all have different definitions of it, in some ways it's sort of standing in for coalition, I think. Yes. Talking about that. And so there are these, now these mass movements that are organized around uh, a black feminist analytic for the first time. This is Barbara Ransby says this, so this is the original, but Barbara Ransby writes this. That it's a black feminist analytic now that is the basis of uh, global mass movements, of interracial movements, of multi-class movements, of you know, et cetera. Uh, and it kind of and it's and it's made, and I think social media has something to do with it as well. But it's made a certain kind of, and we don't know how long it's going to last. These things have happened before, and they fall apart. But for the moment, at least, uh, under this rubric. Uh, that people can justify and explain why certain two two different movements are coming together and they're both marching down you know Fifth Avenue with banners together in the same day. So, so the so is so to me. So I think it's kind of interesting that of how uh, intersection has migrated out of the uh, academy and how it is being used for what uh, you know the we always hope for it to be used for. To channel my inner genetic candelario, <laughs> what, um, <laughs> what, what role might meridians have to play in this, in, in this moment, be it hopeful, you know, promising or um, frustrating or both, like sort of intellectually and politically, what is Meridians? What can we do with Meridians? Well, what, 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 hard question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I know that was that was not in the script. I just went off script. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Adrian. <laughs> Blame uh, Janetta. It was my inner Janetta. Yeah, the, <laughs> but it, but it's always been. But it's been the basis of. I mean, I. I uh, it's been the base, well, one of the things, of course, it's many things, but one of the things is, is it has been the basis for this conversation uh, and this, this intersectional global uh, conversation around uh, feminism and around the, 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 the praxis uh, of resistance and of mobilization. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, uh, and and so and it's it, you know it generates ideas it generates um, a sense of community, which I think is one of the most one of the, the great really extraordinary aspects of the journal and it's what I felt is in editing it you know it, it was a community of all of these uh, uh, of 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 feminist you uh, uh, are talking about. How do we how do we mobilize people and how do we make you know feminism or you know this project of feminism which is always in process and always goes back and forth uh, in terms of success and uh, 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 you know how do we think about this together uh, and so I think uh, and, uh, and, uh, and when we talk about um, in which the importance, like Senator Falls, the importance of the origin story, you know, for Meridians to have the origin of intersection, the origin of transnationalism, race, uh, and gender, uh, makes a big difference uh, in its uh, in its evolution, and, and I think it what and what it means to scholars. Well, and I think I, you know, from the other side of the desk, so to speak, like the the reader slash submitter side of the desk. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to the editor's side of the desk. Um, and it's the same desk, so I mean, there's a relationship there. But I guess I want to say that the journal has been so important in a variety of ways, but one of which is, Paula just touched on it, which is to refuse the false distinction between transnational and intersectional feminisms as if those are not inherently an intimate relationship with one another in terms of a political vision. And then also the beauty, the, the sheer beauty of of the issues um, in terms of the art, the poetry, mixing up genres of, of ways of knowing and 
um, not necessarily privileging always like the analytical, theoretical, you know, having conversational pieces and so forth. That That's like an intervention and it, it creates an invitation for different kinds of readers or, or knowers kind of to, to sit around the table um, with each issue and, and kind of partake. So that I think that actually that has been very, as a reader, it feels like that's been very carefully yeah. constructed and, and worked on um, with intent and intentionality. And then Paula, I just want to say for thank you for dragging me out of my little mini depression there for a minute because I, <laughs> I wanted to say yes, you're right. I mean, um, in terms of intersectionality at work in the world um, and all, all these different facets of interconnected and distinct uh, social movements, and I think there's even been room within Black Lives Matter, for example, to because you can call it intersectionality, you can call on some issues within within movement too. It, it creates space to to do that. And I just it's been interesting for me to in my in the homework I wasn't supposed to do this week um, <laughs> to find, for example, like a lot of work going on around Tubman and uh, Black disability studies. And there's even a collective, a Harriet Tubman collective um, within the Black Lives Matter movement around disability issues and how that connects with environmental racism and poverty and structural inequality and gender and so forth. So like Tubman comes in there too, because have we thought about her and Janelle Hobson did a great piece on that in Frontiers um, a little while after the Tubman symposium. Um, she, she wrote further on Tubman herself. And Janelle really goes in depth about this question of, of how do we think about Tubman in terms of disability and what does that do to our understanding of intersectionality? Um, within a black feminist radical tradition. Um, again, we can't kind of, we shouldn't lop off part of <coughs> and how we think about how did she come to know and do and act as she did. Right. Um, Janelle wrote for another journal. Does, oh. yeah. I shouldn't be talking about that. <laughs> so, so, wow. to, to Adrian's question, it, it also, sows the seeds for other knowledge elsewhere, it's okay. <laughs> um, and linking the one o'clock panel to this, to, to this particular question and, and your answer to it, I was struck when talking to Crystal Brinsook and Camilla mm -hmm. Price that, you know, for both of them, they had written pieces that defied easy categorization and they were worried in one case about like disciplinary fitting or, you know, delivering what their publisher wanted. And one of the things about Meridians is not only is it like validating or does it provide a home, but it actually kind of pushes you to say like, what is the use of those particular categories anyway? And in some ways, Price, I mean that Price, Tubman um, and, and, and Wells are also defying easy categories. You know, that there's something that is quite potentially radical about saying, like, let's not fit in the things that we have, let's make new things that accommodate, like the people in, people in the world. And I find that exciting, both about the journal and about the scholarship that's contained within it. Right, because so, trying, to, trying to enfold Wells or Tubman into the frames that already exist, even in their own time, they're already trying to say, these are not working. And oh, by the way, what are you saying about me? Or how is the right. story going to be? Like, they already understand that the frames already around them in their own time are a problem, much less what we've done since. So they, you know, it's it can't be like old wine, new bottles kind of approach. Yeah. Um, which was once a dean candidate's um, argument for why they should be hired here. I was like, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> Paula, Paula and I might enjoy a nice glass of old wine, but not in a new bottle. <laughs> there has to be this transformation of, you know, the framework, or as you're saying, or as you're saying, Adrian, and by the way, don't ever do that on job market. <laughs> but, but as you're saying, Adrian, that that, um, <laughs> Can can we invent better better methods, better stories, better yeah. better frameworks, better ways that can actually accommodate the wholeness of these of these women's lives, and not try to keep squeezing them into the to the containers that we already have that clearly don't work, and in fact um, suppress the wholeness of who they are. Yeah. So 
for our question, I don't have to channel my inner Janetta Candelario because the actual uh -oh. Janetta Candelario is asking us a question. Um, she asks, given Meridian's focus on transnationalism, could you both speak to the role internationalism or transnationalism played in Anna Julia Cooper's, Harriet Tubman's, and Ida B. Wells's visions, politics, work, et cetera? Uh, uh, Ida Wells, the, in some ways, the highlight of her campaign was her travel through the British Isles uh, in, uh, twice in 1893 and 1894. Uh, and uh, she had to convince uh, the Brits uh, what was happening in the, in the U.S., and because the Brits felt that, you know, one of the controversial things that Wells would talk, say is that the progressives in the United States is, are much, as much of the problem as anyone else. You know, the so-called Wells. I also don't understand what's happening with lynching and, and say it's not happening in the way that it is. Uh, so uh, so uh, she has to, so the Brits are saying, but, you know, uh, but the liberals, how can you say this against, you know, the, the liberals and the abolition movement, former abolitionists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was, so it, it was, it was quite a, um, uh, uh, she, she had a very, very difficult time. The first time it was actually a failure, the, 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 the movement uh, in, in Great Britain because of other kinds of issues. But the second time she learns from her first time uh, and she really conquers um conference the Brits. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Great Britain was the intellectual center of the of the West at this at, at, at this point. Uh, uh, they most importantly, they were the biggest um, uh, importers of southern cotton of American southern cotton. So their opinion meant a great deal. Uh, uh, to uh, the U.S. and when she was able to change that opinion, and 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 so and and connect, she also wrote pieces that connected uh, the colonialism of uh, of Great Britain to the race issues in the U.S. and the Great Britain was going through a very a progressive period at the time as well, a very activist moment, and so she connected all of those claims. Uh, of Africans, of South Asians, of um, uh, of, uh, of 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 uh, uh, American blacks, uh, together to get to help people understand uh, this 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 uh, this issue as an as a global uh, issue. I'm going to try and answer your question on transnationalism with two women who did a lot in those contexts quickly, <laughs> at least to touch on it. Um, you know, Tubman is usually not thought of, I mean, I would say it, she's usually thought of within a nationalist U.S. context, but of course it was um, crossing the Canadian border and manipulating um, manipulating possibilities there and settling her parents in Canada, but moving them back, going back and forth herself to Canada, um, you know, was required, especially um, after the fugitive slave law and other, you know, the Taney court and other things happened. So she... She should be thought of as, you know, when we think about like the history of border crossing feminisms and what what is it what does that look like and how did she navigate um, all of different kinds of geographies and borders between north and south, between rural and urban, between um, the U.S. and Canada. Um, she's she's constantly. I mean, that's why I think it's interesting. Some some black feminist ge ge geographers are taking up um, Tubman's work and also thinking about her know how in terms of reading landscapes, political landscapes, actual physical landscapes, nightscapes, swampscapes, <laughs> um, you know, and also um, in terms of her visions, like refusing kind of that the, the all forms of knowing have to be kind of in the in the analytical like Western notion of, of, uh, of logic. Um, her spiritual visions um, and probably caused by her by her disability being um, having the anvil thrown at her head as when she was a child trying to protect another enslaved person. Um, so she is a transnational figure, but rarely discussed as such. Um, and 
and she, she, she really, this kind of transnational aspect of Tubman's, so she's not only taken up transnationally, as I pointed to in terms of the South African context and the student movement at South African universities just recently, but, um, you know, in her own time, she was busy crossing national borders. Cooper is interesting because, um, you know, in her, in her later life, she did a, she was the first uh, black woman to get a PhD at the Sorbonne and she did her dissertation on the Haitian and French revolutions. And um, she, all she had to work with was the French military archives. So we can imagine, talk about reading the archive against the grain, she did it. <laughs> but she also had this sociologist, uh, white sociologist, uh, civilizationist, AKA supremacist, who, who believed that Nordic people were superior and capable of democracy and that um, people from the Southern hemisphere and particularly Africa were not capable of it. And he said that she would be biased towards the slave because she had been enslaved. And she answered him in her public defense in Paris <laughs> in 1925, that she presumed that he would be biased towards the whites because he was white. <laughs> so um, she was incredibly brave in that defense. Um, and the Nardal sisters were there. Um, Jane Nardal uh, was there and present. And I, we don't we don't have an account except in a brief a letter to Ellen Locke um, back and forth to say that she was present at that defense and basically it opened her consciousness and mind. Oh. And the Nardal sisters in Paris like kind of got brave, if you like, by watching Cooper basically perform and say, you know, because they she wanted to do a different dissertation that connected France's uh, limited imagination in terms of the enslaved in Haiti to their, at the time in the 20s, still colonial domination of um, Algiers. Um, and she told them in her defense, you, the French, might as well as expect capital S surprises, as in people are gonna revolt because we people, we don't like to be owned and dominated. <laughs> um, hey. um, kind of like, you, you need to get ready, but yeah. they wouldn't let her do that um, topic. They told her it was too big and too large, too vast and too big, they told her. So when she was asked at her defense what she thought of his work, because of course he assigned his own book for her to answer to, her first answer standing up in public was, your book was too big and too vast. <laughs> <laughs> that is <laughs> So that's just a taste of, of Cooper. There's other, other stories to tell. She was one of the only two uh, African-American women to speak at the first Pan-African Congress in London. Um, and then Du Bois and others started to change those Pan-African Congresses during the school year. And many black women were school teachers and could not go. And she wrote letters saying, how dare you? Um, and they said, well, we'll change it. But you, um, and then she said, but we still can't afford to come. Like you have two problems. Right. Like you're scheduling this when black women can't come and you're putting it in places where black women can't afford to get to. So we need some fare to get there and you need to change the schedule. Um, so there's a couple of tidbits about Cooper. It's fabulous. Thank you all so much. Thank you for the specific answers. Thank you for all of your answers. Thank you for this conversation. Um, I hope that we will have other variations on it and things inspired by it in times to come. This is the end of our time. Um, we'll see you. Thank you, Adrian. Yes, thank you, Adrian. And how about in the after times, we have some old wine in a new glass. <laughs> But not use it as our selling point that to other people. Good. No, <laughs> no. But, but cheers to the future. Cheers, cheers to the future and the past. Exactly. And thanks, y'all. Thank Bye. Good to see you, Vivian.